welcome to the last chapter it is support and movement in plants and animals support is the ability of organisms to bear their weight and maintain their body forms it includes holding their body parts in their correct positions and allow for movement To achieve this, organisms require a support framework. Movement is the displacement of parts of the body of an organism, for example growth movement of plants and limbs of animals. Movement of the whole organism is termed as locomotion. Movement is a characteristic behavior of all organisms and takes place in response to changes in both external and internal environment. In plants, movement enables them to adequately adjust to the environment. It can occur at cellular level, for instance the growth of a pollen tube to bring about fertilization. Plants also exhibit movement at organ level, such as in tropic and nastic movement. This enables the plant to obtain resources from the environment, such as light, water, and nutrients. They also help the plants to escape or avoid harmful stimuli. A plant needs a supporting framework which must withstand the forces in the environment, for example the forces of gravity and those forces imposed on the shoot by air currents. Plants are ever supporting heavy loads of their own mass, including the animals that climb or live on them. For photosynthesis to take place accessibly, all the photosynthetic leaves and their tissues need to be spread out very well. Support tissues enable the plant parts to be held upright to trap maximum light for photosynthesis. The flowers and fruits also need appropriate positioning on a plant for pollination and dispersal respectively. Based on the nature and distribution of the strengthening tissues, there are two distinct types of stems, herbaceous and woody stems. In herbaceous stems, the tissue is relatively soft and easily crushed. Plants with this kind of stem are usually small and do not grow very tall. If they are deprived of water, the stem wilts bends and may even collapse altogether. Mechanical strength in such stems is directly related to the target pressure of the living cell of which it is composed. Such cells include parenchyma tissues. However, Taga does not have the sole responsibility of providing support. Herbaceous stems also have other kinds of tissues which assist in its support. Some herbaceous plants are known to obtain support by twinning around other plants like the passion fruit stems and morning glory. Others support themselves by use of tendrils like the pumpkin. The woody type of stem, by contrast, derives its mechanical support by possession of support tissues whose cells have stiff, thickened, or lignified walls. Therefore, they are referred to as strengthening tissues. These tissues include the cholenchyma, sclerenchyma, xylem vessels, and tracheids. 
even when completely dry, these cells remain strong and maintain their shape. Whereas the tissues of the herbaceous plants remain fairly soft and are easily damaged, this is quite different from those of the woody shrubs and trees which develop thick, strong trunks and branches. The stems of woody plants grow not only in height but also increase in diameter from year to year. The development of a strong, massive supporting framework is obviously required in support of such structure many meters high. The vessels, trachytes and fibers of the wood are all elongated, hollow tubes connected firmly to one another to form a composite material having resistance to both compressional and tensional forces. Stems of woody plants when young exhibit herbaceous characteristics in terms of support. However, as they mature, they undergo secondary growth that leads to development of more elaborate support tissues. These include the bark covering their trunk. support and movement in animals. Animals have a firm and rigid framework for support known as a skeleton. The rigid framework is necessary because it supports the weight of the animal's body. The framework also gives the animal body its shape and provides surface for attachment of body muscles to facilitate movement. Internal organs are attached to the framework or suspended from it. There are three types of skeletons recognized in animals. These include the hydrostatic skeleton, exoskeleton, and the endoskeleton. The exoskeleton is characteristic of arthropods and is made up of a substance called chitin. Chitin is secreted by epidermal cells and hardens on secretion. This exoskeleton supports and protects the inner delicate tissues of the arthropods. It is waterproof and therefore prevents excessive loss of water from the body tissues. The exoskeleton provides a surface for muscle attachment which is essential for movement. Chitin is not evenly deposited around the body but is thin at joints to allow for efficient movement. One disadvantage of the exoskeleton is that it limits growth. To overcome this limitation, it is therefore periodically shed in a process called molting. After molting, the cells of the arthropod expand and the arthropod is seen to increase in size. During the intermolt phase, cell division takes place but expansion is prevented by the presence of the hardened exoskeleton. The endoskeleton is a characteristic feature of all vertebrates. Unlike exoskeleton, 
The endoskeleton is made up of living tissues like the cartilage or bone. These tissues grow steadily within the animal and therefore do not necessitate molting to allow for growth. The endoskeleton is essential in supporting the animal body weight and gives the body its shape. It also protects the delicate internal organs like the heart, lungs, brain and other organs from mechanical injury. It provides a surface for attachment of muscles which contract or relax to bring about movement. The Human Skeletal System The skeletal system includes all the bones of the body plus all the joints where they attach to each other. Our skeleton protects our internal organs, provides a framework that allows us to stand upright and move, stores minerals that our bodies need to function properly, and produce blood cells. The muscles, contracting and relaxing, produce movement. Without protection of our skeleton, a blow on the head or chest would damage the vital organs. The entire skeletal system of an average adult weighs less than 10 kilograms, harder than reinforced concrete, lighter than steel, and able to repair itself. Bone is the near perfect material to provide framework for the human body. The skeletal system is made up of 206 different bones coming in four basic shapes. The long bones such as the femur, short bones like the wrist and the ankle bones, flat bones like those of the skull and scapula, and the irregular bones like the vertebrae. There are two types of bone tissues, compact bone, which is dense, smooth and often strong, and cancellous bone, which is spongy and lightweight. Both types of bones contain living cells which help make repair if a bone is injured or broken. A typical long bone has a long main shaft called the diaphysis which is composed of compact bone and two ends called the epiphysis composed of the cancellous bone. The main shaft is covered with a membrane of living cells called the periosteum to which muscles and tendons attach themselves. Inside the main shaft is a cavity called the medullary cavity, which contains the bone marrow. Bone marrow stores fat and produces blood cells, playing an important role in the immune system. The skeletal system is divided into two. The axioskeleton, which contains the longitudinal axis of the body, and the appendicular skeleton, which consists of bones that are appended to the axioskeleton. The axioskeleton includes 80 bones, comprising the skull, vertebral column, and the thorax. The appendicular skeleton consists of 126 bones, bones of the shoulder, upper extremities, hips and the lower extremities. The bones of the upper extremities or the arms are connected to the axioskeleton via the shoulder girdle. This consists of the scapula or the shoulder blade and the clavicle also known as the collarbones. The arm itself is composed of the humerus or upper arm and the radius and ulna of the forearm plus the wrist and hand which consist of 27 separate bones.
Because of this large number of bones, the hands are capable of more movement than any other part of the body. The bones of the lower extremity of the legs are connected to the axioskeleton via the pelvic girdle which is formed by the two hip bones. It protects the bladder, reproductive organs, the lower colon and the rectum. In males, the pubic arch of the pelvis is less than 90 degrees. In females, it is greater than 90 degrees to accommodate childbirth. The longest, heaviest and strongest bone in the body is the femur, commonly called the thigh bone. At one end, it is connected to the pelvis and at the other end, it is connected to the lower leg which is made up of the tibia or shin bone and the fibula. The tibia bears all our body weight but the fibula bears no weight at all. The patella or kneecap is a large bone between the femur and the fibula. It protects the knee joint and tendons that form the knee. The bones of the ankle and the foot must carry all our body weight as we stand, walk or run. And the 26 bones in 33 joints that make up our ankle and foot enable it to do just that. Now, the axioskeleton consists of the skull, vertebral column, and the thorax. The human skull is made up of eight cranial bones that surround and protect the brain, and 14 facial bones that form the underlying structure of the face and support for the teeth. With the exception of the mandibles, bones of the skull articulate with each other via immovable joints called the sutures. Throughout the skull, holes known as foramina serve as passageways for blood vessels and nerves. Bones, bones on the surface of the skull encase the brain, protect sensory organs and serve as attachment sites for the muscles of the head and neck. These bones include the occipital bone, parietal bones, temporal bones and the frontal bone. The parietal and temporal bones occur in pairs, one on either side of the head. The facial bones include the nasal bone, zygomatic bones, the maxilla and the mandibles. Other bones become visible only when viewing the inside of the skull. The internal and external skull bones articulate precisely forming an intricate structure perfectly suited to its functions. Next is the vertebral column. One can appreciate the intricacies of the movement of the vertebral column by familiarizing with the bones, joints and the set of complex muscles which make up the spine. The vertebral column in mammals is known as the backbone or the spine. It protects the spinal cord and even supports the head. The spine also serves as a joint for ribs and muscles of the back. It is a cone-like bony structure in the human body and other vertebrates. Human vertebral column is formed by serially arranged units called vertebrae. This vertebral column extends from the base of the skull and constitutes the main framework of the trunk. These vertebrae have a central hollow position which is called the neural canal. The spinal cord passes through this canal.
The entire vertebral column is differentiated into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral and coccygeal region starting from the head. So generally the vertebral column consists of individual vertebrae and intervertebral discs. When viewed laterally, it is seen to consist of various cavities. The cervical region consists of seven vertebrae, thoracic region consists of twelve, the lumbar region consists of five, and, and lastly we have the sacrum and coccyx, which are two composite bones. Now, a superior view of a typical vertebrae reveals such kind of a structure. Anteriorly, we have the body, which is the weight-bearing section of the vertebrae. Posteriorly, we have the spinous process. On the sides, we have the transverse processes. Both of these processes serve as attachment for muscles. Connecting the body to the transverse process, we have the pedicle and transverse process to the spinous process we got the lamina together the lamina and the pedicle form what we call the vertebral arch the vertebral foramina is the hole through which the spinal cord pass we also have the superior articular facets on either side we also have the inferior articular facets, but you cannot see them in this picture. The cervical region consists of seven vertebrae. They create a concave curvature that we can see here. The vertebrae are abbreviated as C from C1 to C7 starting from above. C3 to C7 have common features. The spinous process is short. The vertebral foramen is triangular in shape. A defining feature of the cervical vertebrae is the transverse foramen, which is a hole within the transverse process. We can also see the superior articular facets. The inferior ones can be seen on the lateral view. The transverse foramen is the passage for the vertebral artery, which is one of the main arteries that head up to supply the brain. The first two cervical vertebrae have unique features. C1 is called the atlas. A defining feature is lack of a body or spinous process. Instead, there is an anterior vertebral arch and a posterior vertebral arch. Replacing the body at the front, we have the anterior tubercle, and replacing the spinous process, we have the posterior tubercle. On the sides, we have the transverse process and also the transverse foramen. The superior articular facets are concave in shape. They will articulate with the occipital bone of the skull. C2 is called the axis. It is similar to all other cervical vertebrae except that it has a large prominence projecting superiorly called the odontoid process. From the inferior view on the right, we can see the body of the axis and also the transverse foramen and the articular facets. At the back or posteriorly, we can see the spinous process which is bifid or split into two. All other features are similar to those of C3 to C7.
The next region is the thoracic region where we have 12 vertebrae T1 to T12. On the screen we have a superior view of the thoracic vertebrae and on the right we have the lateral view. At the front or anteriorly we have the body which is heart shaped. Posteriorly we have the defining feature of the thoracic vertebrae and that is the long spinous process which slopes downwards. The vertebral foramen is circular in shape and is much smaller than the foramen within the cervical vertebra. On the sides, we can also see the transverse process and also the superior articular facets and the inferior articular facets. The distinguishing feature of the thoracic vertebra are these costal facets and this is where the ribs will attach. Each thoracic vertebrae has two costal facets on its body and also one on its transverse process. From a lateral view and the thoracic vertebrae are stacked on top of each other. We can see that the first thoracic vertebrae is much smaller than the last one. And the reason for this is that as we descend down the vertebral column, the vertebrae have enhanced weight-bearing functions. We can also see that the thoracic vertebrae creates a convex curvature. Then we have the lumbar region which consists of five vertebrae, L1 to L5. These vertebrae create a concave curvature. All the five vertebrae are similar in shape. They have an increased weight-bearing function and are therefore quite large. Anteriorly, we have a kidney-shaped body. Posteriorly, we have a short blunt spinous process. Lastly, we have the sacrum and the coccyx, which are two composite bones. The sacrum consists of five fused vertebrae. It articulates with L5, the last of the lumbar vertebrae, as well as the hip bones on either side. Down it articulates with the coccyx, the remnant of the embryonic tail, which typically consists of four fused vertebrae. of the forelimbs, the pectoral girdle or the shoulder girdle. This is made up of two halves, each of which consists of three bones, the scapula, the coracoid process and clavicle. These bones are attached to the upper part of the vertebral column. The two halves are not fused but are attached firmly by muscles. The scapula is a flat triangular shaped bone which overlies a number of anterior ribs. At its apex is a concave cavity or depression, the glenoid cavity which articulates with the head of the humerus to form the ball and socket joint. A spine runs along the outer surface of the scapula and it has free end. Close to the glenoid cavity are two projections the acromion and the metacromion, which are both for muscle attachment. The clavicle articulates on one end with the acromion process and the other with sternum. It is for muscle attachment and aids in movement of arms. The humerus is the bone found in the upper arm. Its head articulates with the scapula at the glenoid cavity of the pectoral girdle where it forms a ball and socket joint. The ulna and radius are two bones found in the forearm. The radius is found on the side of the thumb. The ulna on the side of the small finger has a projection called the olecranon process. 
This has a sigmoid notch which articulates with the humerus forming a hinge joint. The olecranon offers a large surface for attachment of tendons and of a stretching of the forearm at the joint. Carpals, metacarpals and the phalanges. The carpals are small bones found on the wrist. Away from the wrist are the metacarpals which are much longer than the carpals. To the end of the hand are the fingers made up of bones called the phalanges. Bones of the hand limb. The bones of the hand limb are the pelvic girdle, the femur, tibia, fibula and the bones of the foot. The pelvic girdle consists of two halves fused at the pelvic symphysis. Each half is made up of three fused bones, the ilium, ischium and pubis. Each half has a cup-shaped cavity, the acetabulum. This articulates with the head of the femur to form a ball and socket joint. Dorsally, the ilium articulates with the sacrum. The ilium is above the acetabulum. It provides large surface to which thigh muscles are attached. Between the ischium and pubis is a hole, the obturator foramen. This is an aperture through which blood vessels, nerves and muscles pass. This design is an adaptation to reduce the weight of the pelvic girdle and hence lighten the load to be supported by the hind limb. The pubic symphysis is composed of flexible cartilage which permits widening of the female girdle when giving birth. The ilium, ischium and pubis are fused to form the inanimate bone. The femur is a long bone found between the hip and the knee. The head of the femur fits into the acetabulum forming the hip joint. At the tip of the shaft are the greater and lesser truncanters, which are extensions for muscle attachment. The shaft of the femur leads to the lower end with expanded and rounded knobs called the condyles. The condyles articulate with the patella or kneecap. They also articulate with tibia to form hinge joint at the knee. A joint is a connection between two or more bones. There are various types of joints which permit varying degree of movement. Joints can either be movable or immovable. Immovable joints include the fused bones of the skull and the pelvic girdle. The bones of the skull articulate via joints called the sutures. Movable joints are found at various points of the appendages. These joints are characterized by bones covered by cartilages at the ends and bones being held together by tough ligaments. The joint area is filled with a lubricating synovial fluid and are also called synovial joints. Synovial joints are of two types, ball and sockets, and the hinge joints. The ball and socket joints. This is a type of joint with two bones, one with a round head and the other one with a depression or cavity into which the head of the first bone fits and moves freely. In ball and socket joints, movement is possible in all directions. A 
Examples of ball and socket joints include the hip and the shoulder joints. The ball and socket joint allow the limbs to rotate through 360 degrees. However, these joints are unable to bear very heavy loads. The hinge joint. The depression in one bone allows the smooth condyles of another bone to fit and articulate to allow movement in one direction. The maximum stretch of the limb at this joint is 180 degrees. Bone joints are found at the elbow, knee and phalanges. Movement at a joint At a movable joint, the bones are held together by an inelastic tissue called a ligament. The ligaments restrain movement of the bones and thus preventing dislocation. At the joint, muscles are attached to the bones by an inelastic tissue called tendon. A muscle is attached at two points. The origin on an immovable bone and the insertion on a movable bone. Muscles which operate joints are in pairs and antagonistic. A muscle may bring about bending of a joint. This type of muscle is called a flexor muscle. While another muscle may straighten the limb and is called an extensor muscle. Movement at a joint can be illustrated well by the action of the binge joint at the elbow. In the arm, there are two antagonistic muscles, the biceps and the triceps. The biceps are the flexor muscles while the triceps are the extensor muscles. Structure and function of muscles Muscle is a tissue specialized for contraction. There are three types of muscles, the skeletal muscles, smooth muscles, and cardiac muscles. The skeletal muscles are attached on the skeleton and play an important role in locomotion. The striated muscles are innervated by the voluntary part of the nervous system and are therefore known as voluntary muscles. When viewed under the microscope, its fibers are seen to have stripes running across them, for which reason it's called striated or striped muscle. Characteristically, it contracts and fatigues rapidly. Smooth muscles are found on the walls of tibular visceral organs. They include the blood vessels, the gut, urinary tract, reproductive tract, and the respiratory tract. The cells which make up smooth muscles are spindle-shaped, each with a single nucleus. They contain myofibrils and closed by plasma membrane. They lack striations and hence are referred to as smooth muscles. Smooth muscles are capable of slow involuntary contractions. The smooth muscles are innervated by the autonomic part of the nervous system, for which reason they are called involuntary muscles. They are capable of contracting slowly and fatigue slowly, unlike the skeletal muscles. The cardiac muscles are the muscles of the heart. Each heart fiber consists of short cells with centrally placed nuclei and numerous striated myofibrils. The ends of the cells are marked by thickened regions called the intercalated discs. 
These form bridges between fibers, hence transmit impulses rapidly throughout the cell. The contractions of the heart muscles are generated from within the heart itself without nervous stimulation. Therefore, the heart muscle is said to be myogenic. The cardiac muscle is capable of continuous rhythmic contractions without fatigue throughout the entire life of the mammal. They have more mitochondria than skeletal muscles to sustain the energy demands. Without many of these discoveries and inventions, few of us would be alive today. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 greatest medical breakthroughs in history. Number 5. DNA Though DNA was isolated in the 19th century, its helix structure was only accurately identified in the middle of the next century. These cellular molecules are now known to carry our genetic code, which allows all living organisms to exist, develop, and procreate. The discovery of deoxyribonucleic acid has since led to the development of gene therapy and opened doors in fields such as forensic science, biotechnology, and more.